The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, know that verse. Jeremiah, prophet of God, was inspired to write that, of course, by his creator. And he was writing it about his brethren, his countrymen, but also about all of mankind, including himself. The heart of man can be very deceptive, very deceitful. And yet so many people follow after their heart. They go by how they feel in their heart. They let their heart guide them. Some may have tendencies to say one thing and mean another, or say one thing and do another thing. Their speech doesn't always line up with their works. Some intend to manipulate others into thinking that they have pure intentions. Now, they weren't the first ones to come up with that. Satan himself, he, he's not a man, but he, his heart is deceitful and he desires to deceive. Now, there are some people that, they're so much into this, this deception that they even deceive themselves into thinking that they, what they have to do or, or, or say is true. They deceive even themselves. Now, of course, we're talking about extremes and generalizations here. Uh, not everybody is out to get everybody else, thankfully. Mankind has a mixture of the knowledge of both good and evil. And that's a dangerous combination, of course. It would be better if we all just had good, the goodness of God in us. But we have a dangerous combination which dwells in wars within us. It's one that each of us has a little bit inside Although we're trying to get rid of it. We're trying to get rid of it so that we can become like God. Let's turn to Proverbs 23. Proverbs chapter 23. There's a brief example here in the Proverbs. Of course, lots of wisdom in the Proverbs themselves. This one is one of the many Proverbs either written or spoken by King Solomon. Some of these others had written down when he said them. Now, this is good wisdom for us, but it, it gives us this example of a person who has wicked intentions, this wicked heart, you could say, a deceitful heart. Now, there are also lots of warnings, uh, especially about our own hearts, what's in our own hearts. But this one is kind of a, a, a picture into somebody who is only out to benefit themselves. Maybe they have a reputation of uh, only benefiting themselves. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 6 Verse 6 here, Solomon said, Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. Now this word miser in this translation, some translations, it translates it more plainly. It says, one who has an evil eye. In other words, one who is looking out to do evil things, to take advantage. Like I mentioned, maybe somebody who has this reputation of only taking care of themselves. Now, this guy invites somebody in, they, they have nice things to say, but their reputation precedes them. Now, this person, it even, you know, it even sounds like he's trying to feed people. Now, feeding people in itself is not wrong, but if we do it for selfish reasons, there's a problem with that. But his heart gives away his true intentions. And we can't always see, but we definitely can't see into the hearts of people. As we read in, in Jeremiah, who can know it? Who can know the heart of man? Verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. That's the true, the true test of a person's character, what is in their heart, their deepest part, their innermost part. He said, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. So it's about the intentions, the heart, the innermost being of a person, their character. That's what this is referring to. Now there's some more wisdom concerning our own hearts in this same chapter in verse 15, Proverbs 23, verse 15, my son. So here we have Solomon writing to his son, but it's as if God is giving us these words as his children, as we grow and mature and learn more. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. Indeed, I myself. So if we have good character and we're using the wisdom of God, God himself rejoices in his heart. Yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Now, the lips have to match up with what's in the heart, but the heart has to be right, so they should match up here. Our actions, our thoughts, our words are dictated by what's in our heart. 
although they don't always match up. That's, you know, we, we read about that, about the, the deception of the heart. But if, we, if our heart is right and we follow that good that God has placed in our hearts, then we will speak right things and be pleasing to God. Proverbs 27, verse 17. That's another bit of wisdom here re uh, reflecting uh, what's in our hearts. And that it comes out. The truth comes out. Even if somebody is being deceptive, they're not speaking what they actually have in their heart, etc., etc., all those, those kinds of things. The truth eventually comes out. And that's a very comforting thing to know. Sometimes we get caught up with various... I don't know, conspiracy theories, conspiracies that happen around us. We want to know the truth. We don't necessarily have to know all of that truth. God knows. Nothing is kept from Him. Proverbs 27, verse 19, another bit of wisdom here. As in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. And when we look into a mirror, we see our face as we, as we are. Now, if we could see into our own hearts... We can see how we actually are. We can see that. But who can know what is in a man's heart? Who can know it? In John chapter 2. Let's turn over to John chapter 2. Here we have an example of Jesus Christ. Our best example who was absolutely pure in heart. And everything in his heart matched with his actions, his words. And were pleasing to his father. Here he is preparing to keep the Passover. Now this was at the very beginning of his earthly ministry when he began preaching and teaching after John the Baptist had, had finished his part. And he goes to Jerusalem to keep the Passover and he's preparing. And he wants to go into the temple. He calls it his father's house. It's supposed to be where the presence of the Lord dwells. And he goes there and he does his own examination of the people around him. He never needed to do an examination of his own heart. Because he was pure in heart, perfectly good, perfectly perfect. John chapter 2, verse 13, gives us this context here. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Things that they were not supposed to do in the house of God. They were buying and selling goods in the temple. Now, they might have made the excuse that, well, it's for the sacrifices of the temple. It's for other people so that they can keep the Passover. It wasn't the place, and it wasn't the time. And so he overturned their, the money changers' tables. He took a whip, and he scared them away. He did his own examination of the people there. He knew what was in their hearts. They didn't understand that they were coming before the presence of God, and they didn't understand that they needed to give that respect and honor in the presence of God. And so he drove them out. And there are many individuals who did not understand who Jesus Christ was, did not understand who his father was. They didn't understand the fact that Jesus had been sent by his father to do his will. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand that he was the son of God nor that he was the one with their ancestors in the wilderness as they left Egypt on that first Passover. They didn't understand that they were drawn to him in many cases because of the miracles that he performed, or sometimes because of the food that he gave out. He always knew that there were some who just came for the meal, but he knew what was in their hearts. On the surface, many seemed to believe, or at least they seemed to listen to what he had to say, but he knew deep inside that not all of them were ready to hear it or to act upon what they were hearing. And he continues on with this examination of people, and it's revealed to us that he knows what is in the hearts of men, because he is God. Both he and the Father know these things. John 2, verse 23, as we drop down here. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. So many people saw the amazing things. They were impressed. So they said, well, he must be an important man. Or maybe they said, well, I hear that he's, he's the, the son of God. I hear that he's the Messiah, the Christ. Well, he at least does some really neat things. So they followed him. Verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself to them, 
because he knew all men. He knew all men. In other words, he knew what they were thinking. He knew their character. It was revealed to him through that spirit that dwelled in him. As, he, as, as a fleshly human being at that point, he had the spirit of his father fully dwelling in him. And he, could, he had that power, that ability to see what's in the heart of men. Verse 25, And had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He didn't need people to say, Well, this, this person's true or that person's false. I saw them do this. I, I heard them say that. Because he knew what was in man. He knew it. Now, if we go back to Jeremiah 17, you can turn there if you'd like. I have it in my notes again. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that, that part where Jeremiah wrote that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If we stop with verse 9 and we don't read any further, we might become very discouraged. Because this applies to us. We might, we might start thinking that, am I... Am I so terrible? Am I deceitful? Am I going around deceiving people and I don't even realize it? Can I even know what's inside my heart? Do I even know who I really am? It's kind of a, a crisis of character there, potentially. Really. But if we read verse 10 and we continue on, even back here to Jeremiah, it was revealed that God knows what is in man. God knows what is in our hearts. Verse 10 in Jeremiah 17, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The, good, the works might be good, but does it match up with the heart? And is the heart good? Or is it striving for that goodness? Giving up the bad, the evil, the knowledge of evil, and the practice of it. Now, I think it's very, it's very comforting to know that God knows what's in my heart. Even though I know there's a lot of problems going on internally. I have my own issues, as we all do. If we say we don't, then we're deceiving ourselves. See that deceitful heart. You know, even deceiving ourselves. But God knows. Both the Father and the Son, they search our hearts daily, all throughout the day, watching us. But it's for our benefit. It's for our benefit, so that they might know us, so that they might know who we are, so that they might know our character and be able to help us and guide us and help us to change what our character is into what it should be. So it's to our benefit that they are constantly examining us very deeply, looking inside of us, seeing what our motives are. Now, there, there are moments where we think, I have good intentions, I have good motives. But they might be incorrect. They might be wrong. We think we have good motives. But thankfully we have God to help us to navigate these things. To help examine us so that we can figure out what is right and what is wrong inside of us. So that we can get rid of anything that doesn't belong. In Matthew 9 verse 4. Uh, verse for your notes. Matthew 9 verse 4. Jesus he's, he knows the thoughts of them around him. And he said, why do you think evil in your hearts? It's another example of the fact that Jesus knows what's in our hearts. He knew what was in the heart of every single person who he ever came across. In fact, he knows the hearts of every single human being who's ever lived or will ever live. Now, in this particular case, there were individuals that doubted the fact that he had the authority to forgive sins. They didn't understand that. They saw the miracles and they doubted those miracles that they saw as well because it didn't match up with what their, their ideas were about who the Son of God was supposed to be. They still doubted even when they saw evidence. And they doubted that he could forgive sins. So he's asking, why do you think evil in your hearts? They even desired for him to fail. Now Jesus Christ handpicked his close disciples. There were many people who he really didn't pay any attention to necessarily. He knew them. He knew their hearts. But there were certain individuals who he held close. He examined their hearts. He even knew which of his 12 disciples would betray him at the time that he called him. Because he knew what was in his heart. He knew their character. He knew their strengths. He knew their weaknesses. He knew their level of commitment to following him wherever he went. And he chose carefully. John 6, verse 64 talks about that. John 6, verse 64, 
It says, but there are some of you who do not believe, he said, speaking to his disciples. It says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Even those in the crowds, and there were many there who might have later turned and repented. But at that time, they would betray him. There are many who initially followed after Jesus Christ. They listened to his words. But he knew which ones were actually being called by his father to follow him. And which ones were too focused on the physical world around them to hear the truth, to, to practice it, to put it into practice, to actually believe it. John chapter 7, John chapter 7, here we, we see that Jesus Christ came to save mankind from the consequences of our sins, but also he came to point out our sins, that examination of our hearts, so that we might be able to change, to give up our sins. John 7, verse 7, the world cannot hate you, it said, he said, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. So he's saying ultimately, even if, if people you know, disagree with us in God's church for the things that we preach from the word of God, if we tell people their sins, they actually aren't hating on us, they're hating on God because he is the one who points out the sins of mankind. It isn't us. The same as, as he does the calling, he has to do the changing of the hearts. And the words that we preach, that we speak, that we live, are his. So we see it's not enough for Jesus Christ just to come and die for our sins. He also points them out so that we might change, so that we might give them up. We need to know what to do. We need to know how to live. We can't do it on our own. We have these deceitful hearts. And so one of the, the, the tasks that Jesus Christ had was to come and tell the world of their sins. Of course, it's nothing new. It's something that had been done for thousands of years through the prophets, through the word of God written down. This was part of the gospel of the kingdom of God. One of the first recordings uh, of, that we have of Jesus Christ preaching the gospel, he says, repent, repent, give up your sins, change. The repentance is from the heart, and it takes an examination of the heart to truly repent. Not just on the outward, uh, you know, the, the outside, not just the appearance, not just in the words and actions, but also, more importantly, in the thoughts, in the feelings even, deep down inside. It takes that examination of the heart to truly begin to ready ourselves for the kingdom of God. We need that examination. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 16. We have... Many examples of God looking at the heart of people. Sometimes people try to say, well, the, you know, the, the God in the Old Testament is different from the God in the New Testament. They think that, that Jesus Christ came bringing all these nice, happy feelings all the time. And they look at the example of, really, Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. They say he's harsh. He's, he's uh, just, you know, comes down and strikes people. But it's the same God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character never changes. His plan for mankind never changes. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I bet you guys are there already. I didn't make it yet. My mouth was talking, but my fingers weren't moving. There's a disconnect there. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance. Now here, this is Samuel is one of God's faithful servants here who was tasked with going and anointing the king. The first king of Israel, Saul, at first seemed like he was the right man for the job in his heart. He was humble, but it went to his head. He deceived himself and he fell away from God. God even took his spirit from him. And so God sent Samuel to anoint David. A man who was a man after God's own heart. Now, David wasn't perfect, we know that. But he never intended to deceive God or to rebel against God. He had good intentions, even when he made mistakes. 1 Samuel, verse, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, let's finish this verse. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. 
because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. No matter how hard we try, we cannot peer into somebody's heart. We do our best. We look at somebody, the evidence of somebody's character by how they act, how they live, the words that they say year after year as we get to know them. But only God knows the heart, even of us as individuals, ourselves. God knows our heart. And that's, again, that's a wonderful blessing. God is better at choosing people for the work that he needs done because he knows who's going to go and do it. And here he chose David. Now David, again, was a man after God's own heart because he never tried to go and deceive God. He always wanted to be in God's favor. And so when he was told that he needed to repent, he repented. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. We see here, toward the end of his life, David was passing on the, the, uh, the throne or the baton to his son who was chosen by God to be the next king. And he did his best to remind his son or to teach his son and later remind him that God looks at the heart. So make sure you're paying attention to what's in your heart. First Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. As for you, my son, and maybe this is where Solomon got some of this wording as he spoke his Proverbs or wrote them down, talking to his son. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. Know him, get to know him. Read his word, practice his things, pay attention to his instruction, and serve him with a loyal heart. In your heart, in your deepest parts. That's what he's talking about. Be loyal to God in your heart. Don't just pretend on the outside, but be loyal to God in your heart. And with a willing mind. In other words, humility, teachableness. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. At the end of the day, that's how it is for us too. If we seek God, he will, he will be there for us. We will find him. But if we rebel against him, he'll cast us off. He's not looking for anyone who wants to rebel against him, to just kind of put on a show. He's looking at those who have the intents of the heart that are focused on doing his will, on serving him, humbly. And he knows exactly what's in our hearts. So here David is wisely giving wisdom to his son. A loyal heart and a willing mind is something that God looks at in all of us. He judges righteously to see what is inside of us, hoping to find that loyal heart and a willing mind. He's hoping to find that in us. This righteous judgment of God is the same judgment that we must have upon ourselves. And we are to judge ourselves. We are to examine ourselves as best as we can. Of course, God sees deeper than we do, but we are to examine ourselves. We are to take a step back and look at our own hearts. And we are supposed to do this all the time. As we're preparing for Passover, we are instructed specifically to examine ourselves, to look inside our hearts, to understand what our intents are, the intents of the, the thoughts in our head, what our desires are. And we can take a look back at how we've been doing since the last Passover. Now, all of us should be doing this all the time, of course. We have special instruction to do it as we prepare for the Passover. We come together, those baptized members of God's church, once a year, we gather, and on that same night that Jesus was betrayed, we take bread and wine that are symbolic of his, his sacrifice, his broken body and his blood that was shed for us. Now before we do that, we examine ourselves honestly. If we don't do it honestly, then we are not judging ourselves. We are not examining ourselves. We are supposed to compare ourselves to, uh, between what we presently are and what God desires us to be. Of course, that's, that's very big shoes to fill, because you know, we are supposed to be like Jesus Christ, who died for us. But that's our goal, and we're not there yet. It's okay to acknowledge that. In fact, if we don't acknowledge that, then, then we are deceiving ourselves in our examination. 
We think that we are somehow better than we actually are. Now, hopefully, we see some growth from year to year. That's our desire. At least some growth, no matter how big or small we think it might be. Perhaps you know, one person's growth might be insignificant to somebody else or vice versa. We're all, we all have our own challenges as individuals. We all have our own uh, problems, our own difficulties, our own sins to, to overcome. But we must begin and we must examine ourselves and continue to give up those sins. Now before we put that bread in our mouth and take a drink of that wine, we have to make sure that we are examining ourselves. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Otherwise we might, we might not understand the, the, uh, the significance of the sacrifice of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here the Apostle Paul, as he was given instruction, is passing on these instructions to keep the Passover. But just like Jesus did, he emphasizes the bread and the wine as these symbols of his sacrifice. And we also wash feet, as we see that, that example that Jesus did in, in the book of John. We're not going to go there today. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. If we do it in an unworthy manner, if we just, you know, we come and we, we say, oh, I, don't, I don't care what I did last week. I'm just going to go and take this Passover anyway. I'm going to go and, you know, even if I haven't repented of my sins, I'm just going to go and do it. Maybe doing it in a, in a um, I don't know, a disrespectful attitude. I don't think I've ever seen that outwardly. Of course, we have to examine our hearts to know what's inside. But the, the interesting part about this instruction is, it doesn't say, you know, ex examine yourself and then if you find something negative, don't take the Passover. Paul didn't say that. He said, examine yourself. Make sure you take it seriously, but then go and take the Passover as you are instructed to do because you need it. We can't say that, you know, because I'm not perfect yet, I'm not deserving of this. I've met people before who, they waited to be baptized, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe longer. Because they didn't feel like they were perfect enough. And they didn't realize that that sacrifice of Jesus Christ was to make them perfect. We can't be perfect without it. So we examine ourselves, but then we go and we take the Passover. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We are commanded to do that. We need the Passover. We need that sacrifice of Christ. Now, the, the Passover itself is a, it's a, a recommitment to Jesus Christ, to our Father. Re-examining that commitment that we made at baptism. Now, before baptism, we count the cost. We decide if we're ready to live the way of life that God has called us to. We count the cost. We see if we can do it not just for a day or for a week, a month, a year, but for the rest of our lives. We count that cost. And when we examine ourselves and we decide that we're ready, or as ready as we're going to be, we go for it. We make that commitment. It is a commitment to God. And we revisit that commitment every year when we take the Passover. That's why it makes sense that only baptized members come and keep the Passover, those who have already made that commitment. Every year we examine ourselves, we count the cost again to recommitting ourselves year after year to the same God, to the same way of life. And we heed these warnings, for he who eats, in verse 29, he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So in order for us to not have this judgment against us, we judge ourselves first. We examine ourselves first. We get rid of the, the sin that we find. We don't take it just, just as, you know, just another meal. We take it seriously. Otherwise, we are guilty of the death of Jesus Christ all over again. And then we're living in our sins again. And so we take this very seriously. And we know Christ sacrifices into free pass to get away with sin. 
Instead, it is a calling to repent from the heart. Verse 30, as Paul continues here, he gives, he gives a warning, kind of a reasoning, perhaps why we, we are going through certain things in life. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Talking about death, the sleep that is death. Now here, perhaps he's talking on a physical level, but most likely he's talking about a spiritual level. Spiritually weak, spiritually sick, spiritually asleep, even though we are walking around with our eyes seemingly open. If we don't examine ourselves and take this seriously, this, this is what might happen to us. We might become spiritually sick, spiritually asleep. Instead, we are to be alive, awake, knowing what is going on, paying attention as we see things around us happening, and going to the Word of God for that comfort and for that correction that we need in our examination. Otherwise, we will be condemned with this world. But God doesn't desire that for us. He desires to give us life rather than condemnation. Verse 31, For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So although God is our judge, Jesus Christ is our ultimate judge, seeing into our hearts, we are to do that examination upon self, self-correction, making sure that we are taking responsibility for our sins, but also going to God for that forgiveness. So we must judge ourselves before we take the Passover so we're not guilty of the body and blood of Christ. Instead, we can receive that blessing from it taking away our sins, washing us clean, giving us life, so we examine ourselves. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 139, Psalm 139. Thankfully, although we are to judge ourselves, this examination isn't done just by ourselves. God helps us with it, because He can see more clearly than we can. He sees through whatever, whatever deception of mind we might have even if we don't see it. God can help us if we seek that help from Him. And we can't do it on our own, and thankfully we don't have to. If God asks us to do something, He makes it possible for us to do it. Even this, this self-judgment, this, this examination of the heart, He makes it possible. Psalm 139, starting at the beginning of the chapter here, verse 1. Here we have David, remember that man after God's own heart. He was seeking God to help him to examine himself. He was going through the same process. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. Even before we think it, God is, is right there. He knows what we're thinking. Verse 3, you comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So David is, is taking comfort in this, and we should as well. We can take comfort in the fact that God is with us. He's watching us. You know, sometimes it feels a little ominous. We think, I've got to be careful what I say or what I think because God's watching. But at the same time, he's, he's watching to see our response. He's watching to see what we allow into our hearts. Or do we get rid of something that doesn't belong? That's what he's, he's, he's doing. Another cry to God to search us, to examine us, is found in verses 23 and 24. We'll read this here. And we have a beautiful song. I think this is one that we sing at Passover after the service. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. In other words, test me. Help me to be examined. And know my anxieties the things that bother me, the things that I have issue with, the struggles that I'm going through. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is what God wants for us. He wants to lead us into the way everlasting, to everlasting life, into His kingdom. That's what God desires of us. But we first must, with His help, be searched in our hearts. We do that self-examination with God's help because He can see more clearly than we can. So we ask God to help even find the hidden sins, as David did. It's a great example here. 
the things that we cannot see, we ask him to help us to, to see. We ask him to help us to get rid of those things as well. And we repent and we change and we follow his ways and not our own. That's all part of the self-examination. First John chapter 2. Ultimately, this is done so that we might get rid of sin, so that we might change, so we might be like Jesus Christ. As we heard in the sermonette, we are precious to God. We've been, our, our, our sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, who is perfect. And he willingly died for our sins, something that we couldn't do and still be alive. We can't give ourselves eternal life if we die for our own sins. We just, we just die. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, here the Apostle John writes, These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he's advocating for us. He wants us to be successful. Now the Father also wants us to be successful. It's comforting to know that the things that we go through, the difficulties that we go through, he went through. He was tempted as we are tempted, but he didn't sin. He was perfect. In verse 2, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That's another whole layer to it, not just for those few that God has called now, but for the entire world who one day will be called, who one day will be asked to examine their own hearts, to hopefully come to the same conclusion if they are willing to get rid of sin and instead receive life. And that's a beautiful thing. But sometimes it's, it can be a little discouraging thinking about all the uh, the difficulties that we see around us, the people that are causing problems more than, than trying to solve them. And we see a lot of evil around us. But God has a plan for all the people, even those people who are out doing deceptive things, letting their, their deceitful hearts take over. God has a plan to offer them salvation at a certain time. But now is our time to be judged in heart, to allow God to, to go inside in our innermost parts, to dig around and say, look, this doesn't belong. You should get rid of it. Of course, we have to take it and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of it. I'm going to repent. Please forgive me of this, this thing that I've done. Help me to change. Help me through these struggles, these temptations, these anxieties. Help me get rid of all of the things that, that push me away from you so that I might draw close to you. Let's continue on here, as John writes, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him. So if we want to draw close to God, we get rid of sin and we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments, we know God. We learn more about God's character. The law not only defines sin, but it also defines how to love. Both how to love our God and how to love one another. And we can't know God and His heart. We can't know Him unless we begin to think like Him, to act like Him. And we can't do that if we're living in sin. So we do as Jesus Christ did and we keep His commandments. Verse 4, He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And so this is what we are called to do. We examine ourselves every year, and then we go and we walk again another year, striving to walk after the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 15. Psalm chapter 15, this is a psalm that reminds us again to examine ourselves, to look at ourselves, what's important to us. Who is God looking for to be in his kingdom? Psalm chapter 15, verse 1, there's a question posed by David, it's really a rhetorical question, to God. 
Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? In other words, in God's house. Verse 2. Here, David is inspired to explain to us the kind of people that God desires. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Not just words that are meaningless, but what is in his heart is right. And of course, God, once he gives us his spirit, he writes his law on our hearts and in our minds so that those things come out. Those are the kind of people that God desires us to be. <laughs> Verse 3, He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, if we've made a promise, we keep that promise. Of course, as long as it doesn't cause us to sin against God, Verse 5, he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does th these things shall never be moved. In other words, those who follow the commands of God, who act upon the word of God as it is written in their hearts, who speak from the word of God in their lives, those are the people that God desires for us to be. So we examine ourselves with God's help to see what is in us, to see if we qualify, to see if this describes us. And if it doesn't, then we change. Back in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17, here we see contrast. Of course, we have the, the heart of man that is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And of course, only God can, can know what's in our hearts. Verse 5, here we have contrast between those who seek things of the world, the flesh, and those who seek after things of God. Thus says the Lord in verse 5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Remember, God is all about examining the heart, whose heart departs from the Lord. Verse 6, For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. So God likens those who, who were against him in their hearts to the desert. It's dry. It's difficult to live there. It doesn't produce. It is barren. It's parched. I don't know if you've ever gone without water. Of course you have, at least for atonement, right? It's that, you know, you get pretty thirsty. Imagine if you're thirsty and you're out in the desert and there's no chance of rain and it's you're on day two. That's kind of the imagery that comes to my mind in this situation. Very dry, parched. Like a, like a shrub in the desert that doesn't grow fruit. It's just sitting there, drying out. I don't know if you've seen tumbleweeds. Sometimes you see them in movies. Uh, those tumbleweeds, you know, they, 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 they grow up when there's rain and then when it's dry, they, they dry up and then they break off from their roots and they just tumble around and cause havoc. They're no good for anything. And that's kind of like this shrub in the desert. Apart from God, it is useless. It's just causing havoc. But there's a contrast here. Contrast to just looking at the flesh, just looking at what's in front of our faces, but instead looking to the kingdom of God. This should help us in that, in that examination of self. What's important to us? Just the things that are right in front of our faces or seeking the kingdom of God. In verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who wants to do things God's way, and whose hope is in the Lord, or whose hope is the Lord. And we see this contrast from that desert, that parched desert, to a place where there's plenty of water. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. We see beautiful fruit that God desires, that fruit that comes from, from following his commands, the fruit that is love. And we're reminded every year, especially at Passover, to examine ourselves to judge ourselves, to look into our hearts, to try to see ourselves as God sees us. He already knows what's in there, but he desires us to take a look to see what is in there, 
to get rid of the things that do not belong, and to take up the things that do belong, to follow after Jesus Christ with a willing heart. Now this examination, this isn't something, you know, I can stand up here and talk about examining our, our hearts all day long, but it's up to us as individuals to actually go and do it, all of us. We can, you know, we, we begin by reading the Word of God. We say, how am I doing? We pray to God. We ask Him. We meditate on His Word. We think, actually, think about how we've been living our lives. We make that examination. We go through that thoughtful process. Now, for some people, it might be beneficial to write it down. I've known some people that write their prayers down. They write down their thoughts. They write down things that they've found in their examinations. And that's fine. If you don't do that, that's fine too. But it's important to go through this examination process, most especially as we prepare to come before God on the Passover, to take up that bread and wine, the symbols of that sacrifice of Christ for our benefit. And we don't take it lightly. We must be willing to make changes when we find something that's wrong. And then we go and we continue to walk. We go and we take that Passover. And we continue to walk and follow after those steps of Jesus Christ. But thankfully, God is with us through this examination process. And we don't do it alone. In fact, we cannot do it alone. So we seek His help. We ask Him to find every, every hidden sin and help us to get rid of it and strive to be more like Him. 